Good evening, everyone. Welcome to ACE 15. Um, I want to welcome you and thank you for being at ACE 15. ACE, ACE uh, this is actually the 15th annual ACE. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's uh, keynote speaker, and I'm very excited to announce that it is the first time in 15 years that we have had a woman speaker at ACE as our keynote. So, <laughs> Uh, well, we have with us uh, this evening Jules Pieri, who's the co-founder co and CEO of the product launch platform called The Grommet. And her company, Citizen, Citizen Commerce, Commerce uh, Movement, uh, movement, is, movement reshaping is reshaping how products, how products are, are discovered, bought, and sold, and shared. And uh, Jules started her career as an industrial designer for technology companies, and subsequent to that was a senior executive with such well-known brands as um, StrideRite and PlaySchool and Keds. Gr the Gromit is her third startup following roles as vice president at Design Continuum and as president of Ziggs.com. She completed her undergraduate degree summa cum laude at the University of Michigan, which we're thrilled to have her back in Michigan. And people tell her she's the first designer to graduate from the Harvard Business School where she's currently an entrepreneur in residence. Jules was named one of the Fortune's Most Powerful Women Entrepreneurs in 2013 and one of Goldman Sachs' 100 Most Interesting Entrepreneurs in 2014. In June 2014, she was invited to the White House Maker Fair to launch the Gromit Wholesale Platform, the extension of the Gromit business uh, connecting makers with Main Street retailers. Jules is frequently asked to be a speaker on consumer trends and technologies and design, and we're very happy to have her with us here this evening. Welcome, Jules Pieri. Uh, well, there, I never feel more at home than when I'm with fellow entrepreneurs. So when I was watching um, the students pitch, I was so with you, you like, go, go, because it's such a hard thing to learn and you never actually stop doing it. I was just last week in San Francisco doing my own pitching because I'm doing a big growth round for my company. It never ends, but you have learned, you'll, you'll end up doing better than me if this one thing never happens to you that happened to me. I once sprung up on stage to give my pitch and I fell. Like the worst <laughs> face plant of my life. <laughs> my knees were bleeding. <laughs> so I actually institutionalized that. I made it an award in my own company, the Bloody Knee Award. We celebrate these things in my company. Um, but I want to, um, I'm going to go, I, I, what I'm going to do here tonight is I want to give you a sense, yes, of my own story, but I hope I can give you some sort of transferable lessons because it damn well better benefit someone else to go through, you know, that I've gone through so many things and I'd love for somebody, the other people here to benefit from some of the things that I've, I've learned the hard way, basically. So, um, twice a month I do go to Harvard Business School and I am an entrepreneur in residence and I meet with eight different student teams or individual students. They're always entrepreneurial and minded. And, they always have the same two questions for me. Um, even though these are very accomplished, confident people generally, they're terrified on t about two questions. Am I cut out to be an entrepreneur? And when will I know if my idea is good enough to really take the leap? So those are the two, two of the questions I'd like to try to answer here tonight, so somewhat through my own story, but hopefully bigger than that. So around the how will I know when I'm cut out for this, um, this is a quote. This is um, the woman who ran Burt Spies. Um, and I, this quote I have on my wall. I've always had it over my desk, and I also have it um, in really huge letters in our office. And it's, I, I can't read it from here, but it's basically, I believe that success is just getting up one more time than you fall. And I really do believe that, too. I do think perseverance is the number one quality of a great entrepreneur. And so then um, you kind of wonder, well, how do I know if I have that? And I tend to look at examples of um, instances where a person in their life did something where they had an easier cho choice and they took the hard road. So that could be something like trying out for a really, or t training for a really hard athletic event. It could be trying out for a play when you can't sing. 
It could be um, the person who moves out of state when it's really scary, or the person who finances their own college education. It can even be the person who shows up when somebody's sick. That's harder to do than to, to not show up. And so those are really traits of an entrepreneur for me. And my own father, um, in some ways, showed me that perseverance thing in, in big ways. I'm actually wearing his ring. He was an auto worker. He was a tool maker at Livonia Transmission, very mm -hmm. close to here. And he never missed a day of work for 30 years, so this ring is engraved with a 30. And so if that's not training or sort of at least a role model, I don't know what is. Um, and this is where I kind of got to get my first falls and, and get back up. Um, mm. I grew up pretty close to here as well. In fact, I did a Saturday bow bowling league at Cloverlane. Uh, mm -hmm. Clover it's almost right across the street. Um, but this is on the west side of the street, my, my, my house. And um, I grew up, as I mentioned, with a dad who was an auto worker. My mom was a homemaker. And I didn't have a lot of... Um, professional role models, but I had great role models in life in the two of them in terms of their expectation for me was basically be a solid citizen to um, carry my own weight. But I didn't know a whole lot about business or um, I ended up being the first person in my family to even go to college. But that was kind of a gift, honestly, to have no expectations. I didn't really have to, m to match anybody else. Nobody could really um, give me much guidance. But if you know, if, that, if, if you can run with that like an entrepreneur would, I did. So to me, that was always a, a great gift. Um, and I moved from Detroit, as, as mentioned by Diane, to, um, to the University of Michigan. But there was the most important thing I ever did entrepreneurial in my life was actually, um, this is a picture of me at um, boarding school, actually. I was in Detroit Public Schools in ninth grade, and I snuck behind my parents' back, applied to Kingswood Cranbrook, mm -hmm. and... I ultimately got a scholarship and I moved there and it was the most terrifying thing I've ever done to date. I was 14 and every day I would be absolutely sick to my stomach before school because I learned really quickly that when I went into Algebra 2 class I actually never had Algebra 1. Mm -hmm. So I was making up for an awful lot. So to me nothing ever could be as scary as that and you know I leveraged that into an awful lot of firsts where I just learned that sort of grit of like It'll be okay. You'll get through it. And that's what it's like being an entrepreneur every day, finding those sort of sources of, okay, I did that. Okay, phew, a little bit more confidence. So in terms of my career, um, Diane mentioned some of the, some of the, the core things. I was, the first, I was the only person in my class at Harvard Business School to join a startup when I graduated. It was a very unpopular thing to do. It was a big time for management consultants and investment bankers. So my first one was Continuum still thriving. Um, it's a product innovation consultancy in Boston. And some of you might know it's a more sort of visible competitor IDEO. It's a very similar business to IDEO. Um, Ziggs, I was president and COO, and that company competed with LinkedIn. And you know who won that, because <laughs> you've never heard of Ziggs, I'm sure. Uh, we ended up selling to reputation.com, but what it really benefited for me was that I was really early in social media before any of my friends knew anything about it, which ultimately um, was something that really mattered a lot in thinking of the idea for the grommet. Um, I did a bunch of big company stuff, and, I and there's one common theme here, which is a person. My uh, mentor in business ended up being Meg Whitman. She landed on my head as my boss at Keds. Now she's famous for being the CEO of Hewlett Packard and formerly eBay as well, um, but she wasn't famous then and that's irrelevant to me. Um, what was relevant to me is she believed in me and she let me really prove my mettle. So when I was working for her in my final assignment at Play Schools, when I really actually had the idea for the current company I'm working on, the Gromit, but I didn't know it at the time, I just sort of, sort of saw the opportunity, um, which was this, that I noticed that the business of product launch was massive and very broken. And what I saw very specifically at Play School is we had a wonderful design and development and engineering organization coming up with brilliant toys, and the very best ones never got made. They never got past early production. And I would ask why, and the answer was always the same four answers. Well, Target, Kmart, Walmart, or Toys R Us didn't want it. And what had happened along the way is the toy industry had lost its specialty retailer layer of distribution where those toys would have had a chance to get proven 
the farm leagues were missing. And that didn't make the big retailers evil, but it meant something very dangerous for innovation. And it made me really mad, and I think I walked around mad for about 10 years. I honestly didn't see a fix to that, and ultimately that's what I'm working on at the Gromit. So the business of product launch, even to this day, looks like this. The big can win. Even, you know, Play School wasn't losing. It's just that we were losing. We weren't seeing the best products, but they were getting products on shelf. So the big have relationships. And there are lucky breakthrough companies, but they're unicorns. They're the, the Pebble, you know, on Kickstarter. They're the Spanx that Oprah plucks out of obscurity. It's not a business plan to be big or lucky. And that should be fixed. I really think that there's a need to, to really change how that works. And that's what we're working on um, every single day at the Gromit. So this is a kind of strange thing to say. The more innovative a product it is, the less likely it is to succeed. But it's what I've seen in my career. If you don't expect it to exist, you're not looking for it. And it has a really tough battle. So I'm going to show you an example of one of those kinds of products that when you learn about it, it's pictured here, Sugru, you would walk right by this in a store. But when you learn its story, you're going to be interested. I'm going to show you, it's actually a an old video because this um, is a product we launched quite a while ago and our company still was called Daily Gromit. We've changed the name to the Gromit. So um, it's kind of a charming video to me to see such an old one. Today's grommet, Subaru, is a moldable silicone putty that cures at room temperature and stays permanently. It does not conduct electricity, it can go in the dishwasher, and it can attach to just about any material. I think what's incredible about it is just how flexible it is. And what I really liked about it is that you can make something brand new that you thought up yourself, or you can fix just about anything that's broken. Hello, I'm Jane, and this is Subaru. Subaru is for hacking, improving, and repairing your stuff. A hack is a clever solution to an everyday problem. And yesterday, we had a bunch of people here hacking their stuff better. Sugru sticks to lots of other materials. You can form it by hand, and it cures at room temperature to a soft touch silicone rubber. And because it's silicone, it's dishwasher proof, heat resistant, and durable. People are natural hackers. We've just got out of the habit of it. And what's really class is that once you start hacking, you see things everywhere that can be improved. And that's what Suru is all about. The freedom to hack, to improve, to modify and personalize. And now, after six years in development, Suru is finally available to buy. So it's a little bit like grown-up Play-Doh, right? And solving grown-up problems, everything from your freight electrical wire to your shoe that causes a blister, it molds like that Play-Doh putty, and it comes in a variety of colors that you can mix and match. So if you're trying to match something exactly, you might be able to get there with mixing some of these colors. You can also show off your solution. So I think right. there is this sense of play and kind of, and hacking is is fun. So it's, you know, just having this around opens your eyes to all the possibilities. Sugru in Gaelic means to play, and Jane has infused a lot of that whimsy into her product and her brand. There's an entire community built up around this with all of the different hacks that people have created to show all the different ways they've solved their problems. So whether you are just frugal enough to want to keep things longer and hack things better, Sugu really is the universal problem solver. So every day my company's flooded with ideas like this. We see 300 a week and we launch five to seven of these companies. And I predict Sugru is going to be a future uh, product like WD-40, right? Who doesn't have that in their utility room or wherever? And Sugru is equally useful, but again, it comes in these tiny little packages. You would walk right by it. So there's a role for the storytelling of these companies. So I, one of my, um, when I answer those Harvard Business School students about, you know, when do I know if my idea is good enough? I actually, my only question is, is it big enough? Because it's going to be just as much work to build a small company as a big one. It's false to believe it will be less work. And you really want to go after a very large market where you have a lot of chances to screw up, basically. If you have a very narrow market and a narrow approach, you've got one shot. You want lots of shots on goals. You're not going to get it right, right out of the gate. And so the thing that most upsets me at Gromit is when we see product submissions that are after something really tiny, like a two month span in a child's life, you know, where for that parent, it's everything, but it's such a short time and it's gonna be a small market. 
or products that are just dumb, like a perfume that makes women smell younger. I mean, some products just don't deserve to exist, I think. But for the person's life, it should be very, very big. So for me, going after product launch, particularly in consumer products, which is 70% of our economy, I knew I had a huge target. I could get it wrong multiple times and still have a chance. But also for me, as a person, I wanted to have an impact on the world. I wanted a mission-driven business that would actually change how things work. And I actually believe that business as an institution, you know, that's my art, that's my sport, that's my craft, is business. And I believe that business, businesses, even above government, nonprofit, educational institutions have faster, you know, they're more nimble, they're faster, they have more resources and ability to impact the world than anything else. So I wanted to build a business that actually gave people a chance to react to that and participate in that and form businesses. So we started a product launch platform. We started October 2008, right after Lehman Brothers collapsed. And every weekday since then, October 20th, we've launched a product or two with a video story about it. We were like a little voice in the woods for a really long time. But the one thing that happened when only our mothers and brothers were following us was mm -hmm. that makers, the people behind these products, started showing up in droves when we were meaningless in terms of market impact. But they understood, when we had just a landing page, just a page that's not even a full website that explained what we were going to do, they started submitting their products. Because they understood we were talking about something that was their hair on fire biggest problem and that we were coming up with something that sounded like it would be collaborative and unique. And that is exactly what we did. So I'll talk about some of our um, earlier successes that you would know at this point, or most of them at least. I'm wearing a more modern version of a Fitbit, but that's what it looked like when we launched it. And this was before people were really saying Internet of Things. It was not sort of a buzzword. We were launching those kind of products because we were seeing that this intersection between physical products and data, your data, was it's, it's, like a, it's like a completely different um, take on a, a completely new layer in products and what can be done in your interaction with both the retailer and the manufacturer and your own data. Probably a third of you own this at this point. It's everywhere when I travel internationally, even SodaStream. It was an Israeli company that had gone dormant and really wanted to come back at the U.S. and so we launched SodaStream. Um, Goldie Blocks, it's kind of appropriate, it's, it's Super Bowl week. I know you guys probably hate that I support the New England Patriots, but um, it's a team everyone loves to hate. But um, last year, during the Super Bowl, Goldie Blocks actually had a free ad, uh, courtesy of Intuit, because they won a competition. And this, co this is a company we had launched well before Intuit know them, knew them, but it's a fairly recent launch for us. And what I like about them, or what I, what I do think they express, my co-founder says, this is the luckiest company on earth. They do actually have an awful lot of luck in their history, when you, if you ever study them. If you, if you um, go to the sort of Royal Oak um, type stores, or Rust Belt Market type stores, you might see this product. It turns any mason jar into an adult sippy cup. It's made in the USA. <laughs> um, so is this product. It's a yoga mat that is like um, combining twister and yoga. Basically, like if you want to learn yoga in the privacy of your own home, you just follow the numbers with a DVD. And Michigan has had a disproportionate representation in grommets. This is really good, actually. 23 um, grommets have come from Michigan. A full 25% of them have come out of the Grand Rapids area. They represented, re represent all the 20 categories that we work in. And I thought I'd show you, actually, um, the second most recent Michigan it because there's actually a little bit of a story behind it that I like. This one is, I'm going to show you a video of this one as well. Pan Grillet's cast iron insert makes it possible to get that delicious, fresh off the grill taste year round. It also elevates food above accumulating juice and grease, so it doesn't just taste better, it's also lighter and has less fat. Cast iron has been used to cook for thousands of years, and with good reason. It improves taste and effectively boosts iron intake. Iron is crucial for maintaining energy levels and it helps strengthen your immune system. Scott Lewis, the creator of Pan Grill It, was determined to find a system to grill that wasn't weather dependent. So the Pan Grill It, what can you use it for? 
Again, you can do it for indoor grilling, whether it be rainy day grilling, winter grilling, perhaps just cooking for one, you don't want to fire up the whole grill. You can also use it as a trivet. You just flip it upside down, it goes inside of a Dutch oven, seven quart or larger. It's made right here in the USA. The finest quality of cast iron, extrapolated right out of the Appalachian Mountains. The misconception for years that people thought you always had to clean cast iron, and that's not true. You simply care for it. And all you need to do is just simply remove the food debris. And when it's done, you want to lightly oil it with a high smoke point oil. Something like a peanut oil, avocado oil, uh, coconut oil. A fantastic place to store cast iron, of course, is your oven where it's dry. It's not going to you know, have the oxidation where it's going to rust. This is built to last forever. Pan grillets insert can be used with any uncoated skillet that's 12 inches or larger, and it's pre-seasoned for your convenience, so there's no need for cooking additives like oil or butter, meaning you can enjoy all the wonderful benefits of cooking on the grill without needing one. So, Scott, we met Scott last spring at uh, the International Houseware Show. He had a tiny table, and he'd been struggling. He'd been battling this business for a couple of years. Nobody was paying attention, and it's a brilliant product. It's humble, it's simple, but it's brilliant. And we launched his product to great success. In fact, at the moment, he's sold out. So if you go on our site, unfortunately, you won't be able to buy one. Um, but for him, that's a normal course of life. This happens a lot in makers. They go through waves of production runs. But the biggest thing that's happened to him, remember, he wanted to secure a large retailer. This was his goal. And he, I saw this post on Facebook from him just a couple weeks ago where he said, that a large retailer had been evaluating QCing his product for two months and he asked them where they found the product and they said the grommet of course we've been followed by large retailers and media companies since almost day one and what really touched me that was great that, that the company said that and he said that he just had opened the email it was Hamacher Schlemmer a big catalog company and he had spent the entire day avoiding opening that email because he was so afraid of yet another rejection. And that just so touched me, right? This is what we do. This is what we change for these people. If we'd met Scott two years ago, we would have taken two years of pain and suffering out of his life. I'm sure of it. And we're doing that every day for the companies that we launched today. So I just don't accept that retailers should decide for us. I don't accept that we, as a community, shouldn't decide what companies um, support our values and what companies should succeed. Um, I even trademarked this term called citizen commerce to represent what I mean. You know, we've, we've taken over the media in many healthy ways, citizen journalism and citizen science, and I think commerce needs a bit of a takeover as well. So that's what we set out to do, and um, we tell the story of, you know, we built a media platform to tell a story of one new product every single day at noon, Eastern Standard Time, and we wanted it to be a place where the community would both not only help to guide us to these wonderful products, because you all know a product we should know about. I'm sure of it. And so to use the power of community in a technology platform to find those products, but then ultimately turn them back over to the community with a beautiful story, and the community decides again, is this something we want to support? So video is very central. I shot a video before I hopped on the plane here. We still, you know, all of us, these are real team members in these videos. I do them too. And the people that we're really working for are people that um, were mentioned earlier, the maker movement. And it's a hotbed of the maker movement in this state. This state has a, an amazing advantage for the maker movement. People who make things think differently. People who grow up around that think differently. People understand how to use hand, their hands and tools and technologies are different. That's why Michigan has so many grommets. And there are a lot of external um, sort of rising tide things happening around the maker movement. A lot of them are technologies. So it's the rapid prototyping technologies like 3D printing or laser cutting. It has to do also with hacker spaces. You, you have a rich resource here in Detroit with Pony Ride and Tech Shop. There's a lot of opportunity just in this place. It's better than Boston in that regard by far. And then in addition, crowdfunding, because remember I, I sort of reject that retailers shouldn't decide what products we see. But I also don't think that large manufacturers should always do that. And crowdfunding levels that playing field where you don't have to be in a big company and hope and pray that someday somebody will listen to this idea and give you a few bucks. Crowdfunding will do it right there. And then finally, I'm an industrial designer, so my job has always been to design the future. Nobody does, you know, paid me to design today or even, even the near, near future. And that's the same thing I apply to this business model. And so I always watch how the intersection of behaviors and technologies create opportunity. 
and the millennial generation, I couldn't be more excited about that generation because what they expect from business is very different than prior generations. They're very comfortable with entrepreneurship and for-profit enterprises. They're not maybe like the people a little bit older than me that wanted to see in the 60s throw over everything, but they share some of those values where they want to know, okay, who are you? Who are these people behind a business? And, and what is it that you're doing in the world? And what does your product represent? And those are the stories we tell. When we select a grommet, the first cut is always what value does this company have, this product have that our community might care about? It could be a new technology. It could be domestic manufacture. It could be coming from an underrepresented entrepreneur, somebody under 25, over 65. It could be a social enterprise, a green enterprise. These are things that this, this generation, not only this generation care about, but they articulate much more strongly than other generations. Um, Diane mentioned we were invited to the White House. And so what the Obama administration was really trying to do, um, the, white, the Maker Fair, you have one in Detroit, it's one of the premier ones. Over 25,000 people came last year and across the 100,000, I'm sorry, 100 Maker Fairs, it's sort of the Lollapalooza or the Woodstock for makers, right? This is where makers go. And um, the 100 ones that were across the world had over half a billion people come last year. These are major, major events. But the White House had never had one. And it was a teeny one because it was actually in the White House. I'd never been there. I didn't realize it's really small. <laughs> and so there were very few of us allowed to come. And we came because the administration wanted uh, people who are central to the movement to demonstrate business commitment that's taking this away from just the DIY sort of science fair roots to re a real economic movement. So we made the announcement of the extension of our, our business model into wholesale. So the maker entrepreneurs who I think about all day long, all day long I think about how to make them successful. So I want to introduce you to one of my favorites. Her name is Lisa Fetterman. She's in San Francisco. And she's made the Nomi Coup. And if those of any of you watch, are people here watch cooking shows like Top Chef or, you know, on the Unit Topped to. and all I'm those? You know um, the cooking method sous vide. It's a, it's a warm water bath for yeah. proteins like meats. And it's really expensive. The equipment to do it is, is commercial grade generally. And, and Lisa decided to take that on with her product, the Nomi Coup. So I'm going to introduce you to her with a really quick video. I'm not very polished. I am a professional maker. This is not going to be like a sexy TED talk where I have a big lesson for you guys. It's just what I know. I started this company with my husband when I was 22, and now I'm 25. This is what we do. You put your food inside of a bag, and then it goes into a precise water oven. You clip it onto any pot that you already own, and it circulates your water and heats it to a precise temperature. And it looks like this. I'm gonna Vanna White it a little bit. And it didn't always look like that. When we first started, it was just a PID machine. We have an aquarium bubbler over there, some duct tape and a chopstick. I was watching Top Chef and I saw, oh my God, look at that sous vide machine, right? It is, it is beautiful. It's making the food so perfect. And when you watch like the judges eat that food, it's like pure like orgasm, like tears out of their eyes. You're like, I want that for myself. And then I went online to check the price and it's $800. And I'm like, well, I'm a student. I really can't afford that. And my husband, then boyfriend at the time, we have been dating for a week. He's a plasma physicist. He really wanted to impress me. So we could make it ourselves. I was like, holy crap, are you, are you serious? After we built this, we could hear the garbage trucks coming in. It was four in the morning. We had started like at 6 p.m. And uh, being in New York City, we could run down to our bodega and get an egg. We set it to 64 degrees Celsius. And at that temperature, the middle of the egg actually coagulates and cooks before the whites. So it's an inside out cooked egg. We're like, oh my god, this it blows our minds and it's delicious. We have to tell everybody. And we became the number one most funded Kickstarter in the food category ever. And we are very late in delivering, which is what I'm, I'm very sorry for, but we've been very open in our process and nobody hates us, you know? <laughs> so, welcome to my world. The Lisa Fettermans of the world are, 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 are my people. Um, but I believe this is a very large um, economic impact or uh, economic movement. In fact, some of the numbers are really starting to show it. Over the last two years, year over year growth in patents is 10%. I mean, patents are not a lightweight activity. And so much of this is going into physical products that we see every single day. 
I'm not going to try to read you this eye chart. I'm just going to refer you to Google. We created the only infographic that I know of on the maker movement. So if you just Google maker movement infographic, you'll get a lot of really sexy stats around this. But the part that, that people don't necessarily connect is to their local economies in that um, these are the products that really fuel Main Street. These are the products that really help independent retailers, the kind of shops that many of you probably would like to frequent. And when you buy in those stores, you buy from a local business, 68, I think it's $68 of $100 stays in the local community versus if you buy from a national chain, it's $43. So you really want to, you know, for your, the benefit of your own communities, care about these makers because it extends to your own personal life very quickly. What I believe, personally, that this is the next industrial revolution, huge companies will be built. I heard earlier the connected home product, the Nest was mentioned, you know, the, the smart thermometers. And there will be some breakout ones like that, I'm sure of it. There'll be more of them, the Fitbits of the world. Nest was sold for $3.2 billion to Google. They will happen, but I actually believe, and some of you in the room are already entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs, there's another whole other vein of opportunity around the maker movement, which is to help these companies because they're brilliant at product, but the minute they launch, they're up against the big guys and they have to be good at 15 different things right away. So Shipwire is all about logistics. Shopify is all about e-commerce. Obviously we talked about funding. Manufacturing in the US, that's maker row, maker's row business. Tech shop for prototyping and early production runs. There's a host, there are 15 different things they need. So if you have ent entrepreneurial ambitions but you don't necessarily want to be a maker yourself, think about what they need because this is not yet fully baked. This is just early days in this space. And I hope when somebody else does a presentation on the maker movement, they show the Gromit logo because we're cracking what our makers say is the toughest problem, which is okay, I release the world's best mouse trap, or I, I just come out of Kickstarter, and it's crickets. It's, it's really scary, actually, after you launch. You know, it's very hard to keep momentum and to, to cut out those two years of pain or suffering, because those two years can be death. It's really important to scale as quickly as possible. So right now, we have one in 200 Americans following us on a daily basis. That's one in 50 of the relevant market. So within one hour of launch, we know exactly what America thinks of any undiscovered product. That's a huge, huge thing. I couldn't have said that two years ago. We've grown a lot. So um, in terms of my answering the question, is this big enough for us? It's a $400 billion opportunity in the US alone, and I have global ambitions. So I'm going to um, move on to sort of, this is all the like, happy stuff of the store. Is the store. I'm going to tell you some of the hard stuff um, before I end. But for me, this business, the business goal here is, say, three years out. When we launch a grommet, it will be a cultural and a business phenomenon. It will be a cultural phenomenon because people will know that a community did this, that they found this product and they carried it forward, that they believed in it, that it was worthy. That's a cultural phenom phenomenon. It will be news. A business phenomenon because that community will be large enough to actually make markets. We're already getting there and it will be there within three years. Um, but this has been really hard. Um, I can tie it up with a neat bow right now, and I kind of just did. Um, but every business has tough challenges. And I think for some companies, it's probably going to be a legal challenge. Something's just going to come out of nowhere. Or it could be a competitor that comes to eat your lunch. Or it could be a really tough senior hire that threatens to take you down. And we didn't have any of those. I hope we never do. We may. But what we had was a fundraising challenge. And these shoes are my real shoes that I wore. Actually, I've, wore, I, I've walked my shoes off raising money for this company. We were bootstrapped for four years, absolutely starved, even though we have wonderful angel investors who I believe are the heroes of the American economy. It wasn't enough. This is a, this is a business that needed um, more capital than it could get at the time. And this, <laughs> the real story is I was walking between one venture capital pitch and another in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and my shoes literally started disintegrating underneath me. Just gone and so at the second pitch I had to do it on my toes because like I had no heels left and as I was walking around the really fancy office they had white carpeting I had to pretend I wasn't like leaving a pig pen trail which I absolutely was um, and I always think of that that that's exactly what I had to do to fund this business we were near death several times and the timing was just really tough we launched um, when the capital markets were slammed shut and existing investors were really trying to protect and save their existing companies 
And then our idea was really probably four years ahead of its time, and we were such a happy and are such a happy and optimistic business. Remember those times? Nobody was happy. And, and so we were just sort of out of sync with everything. And then I didn't look like a typical entrepreneur to boot. So there were a lot of challenges. But there was uh, a reward. I walked all the way to Tokyo to fund this company, effectively. Not across the ocean, but basically. This man is the Jeff Bezos of um, Japan. His name is Mickey Mikitani. He's the founder and CEO of a company called Rakuten. It's the third largest e-commerce company in the world. And he understood my vision. He understood our accomplishments, and he invested. So our first large investment was late 2012, and we grew from a $2 million business to this last year we were 23 million, and in 2015 will be 40 to 50 million dollars. And I credit, you know, I'm so I look like such a fangirl in that picture. That's me in my old office because I am. I love that man. <laughs> um, but even this funding, which was a wonderful event, had some real drama. And I've never told this story on stage, but it happened here in Detroit. So I have to tell you this story. Um, so at the exact same time, I'm negotiating hard and fast with Tokyo. It's really difficult, right? It's language, time zones, hard. My mom was in her final days of a, a three-year battle with colon cancer. She was at Henry Ford Hospital, and so I was pretty much living here for those, that time um, for the last days and been back and forth a lot. And this is um, my mom in Henry Ford Hospital with my sister. She's six months pregnant. Lisa, and she's, um, my mom's fondest wish was to see that baby born, and she wasn't going to make it. And my mom's oncologist, Dr. Randa Lutfi, um, commanded an ultrasound machine to come into that room, and my mom saw that baby. And that enough is dramatic, but that few nights later, July 3rd, I was sleeping at the home of my oldest childhood friend. I'm going to sleep there tonight as well. Grew up in that house near her. And there was a thunderstorm like only Michigan can do. I mean, I, I miss them so much in Boston. We don't have them. It woke me up. I was out of bed looking out the window. And I got a phone call from my aunt that my mom had passed. And so I'm looking at my phone. And I'm, you know, I'm, well, I'm thinking all the things you think, but also thinking, well, who do I call? What do I do? And I got a letter of intent email from Tokyo that the investment was going to happen at that moment. And I have decided that what happened was my mom went up to heaven and mm -hmm. threw some boulders around mm -hmm. to make sure this deal got done for her daughter. So I still credit my mom with that deal. So um, all of you know some of this, if not all of this already, but the big sort of characteristics of this journey are these three things. Um, first of all, an emotion. I think you need to know, you know, entrepreneurship's a black box until you do it. But I knew from big companies, the primary emotion is frustration, right? Because there are you know, so many obstacles in your way to doing smart, fast things. And if you can manage that frustration and still keep pushing, you can have huge success if you don't let that frustration kill you. And a startup, it's anxiety. It's you. It's all you. Well, there's nothing more anx anxiety provoking than that. You know, I'm still anxious. Last week, pitching in San Francisco. It's a big round I need to do. I want to get this done. It matters. I have urgency. And it's all on me. So that kind of never goes away and never should. You just have to embrace it. Um, Action, bias for action. I mean, that's the other thing I had to learn going from a big company to a, a startup in that done is better than perfect. You're constantly moving. You're li I, feel, I sort of liken it to being a shark. Like if you stop swimming, you'll die. You know, that's how I feel about being a startup um, leader. Because by def definition, the difference between a big company and a startup is resources. If you're at point A and you need to get to point B, as a startup leader, the difference, your resources are only A level, and you need to get to B, you need to prove your B you know, level. You do it with your body, you do it with your smarts, you do it with your speed, it's all human capital. That's why the action matters so much. And then the last one is just ambiguity. That really hit me hard at Ziggs, my second startup, where I was a little more mature and I was a leader. And the, you know, the phones aren't ringing, there's no last year to repeat, there's nothing that you sort of just make better 
there's nothing you can sort of find comfort in. It's just a blob at first. And you have to accept that as well. Venture capitalists told me that, and I was like, phew, that's exactly what it feels like. Mm -hmm. So those are the three A's of entrepreneurship, which you guys probably already know. Um, and I'm going to leave you with two final thoughts. One is for anyone in the audience, entrepreneur or not, you have a chance to make your own dent in the universe. That's the Steve Jobs you know, phrase, dent in the universe. In, in that if you really think about um, the power you have as an individual consumer in allocating 10% of your own budget to the things you really care about, the companies you really believe in, you're voting with your dollars and it's the easiest, most impactful thing you can do. Talk about those companies, share those companies, and support those companies. You know, obviously I think we do provide a way to do that on Gromit. We're not the only way, obviously. I'd support Kickstarter and Indiegogo campaigns too. This is me, a couple weeks ago, we finally got branded boxes for our company and I was excited and buy differently is kind of how we describe that. Um, the other thing I'll leave with you, you with is um, this baby and my goal for her. Now this is that, that baby. This is the baby my sister had. Her name is Wren. She was born September 20th, um, 2012. I got the phone call that my sister was in labor and I flapped my wings really hard on a plane and made it on time for her birth. And um, when I saw her born and I thought about her, I thought about a goal I have for her, which is I have three sons, I don't have a daughter, but I can ask them to name 10 entrepreneurs and they will name 10 men other than me. And that's normal, that's kind of what they know in the world. But I have a goal for Ren that when she's 15, this is my goal, the, the date, 2027, that she'll name 10 entrepreneurs and five of them will be women. And here's how you can help, because there, this is a hard, that's a hard, that's harder than Gromit, believe me. To get that goal done is going to be tough, because at the moment, um, only 2.7% of venture capital goes to women. And um, it, they do, women do better in a, with Angel and really well in crowdfunding, 47%. So I'm really looking for more women to become investors, period, as angels, as venture capitalists. Let's change the fact that only 4% of and venture capitalists are women as well. But you as customers, as employees, have a role too. If you're running a conference or you're uh, in the media, make sure that at least 30%, I, I, don't, I don't like kind of get rigid about 50%, but let's look for 30% gender balance, one way or the other. I mean, if it's all women, it should be 30% men. I, I have that requirement in my own company and in our teams. Google's proven that when things fall below 30%, everything kind of goes haywire. And also companies with diverse leadership teams have a 31% higher return on invested capital. So if you're looking at a job and you have two choices, there's a diverse team and there's a, a non-diverse team, take the bet on the diverse team. First of all, the company will probably do better, but also men in a new Bain study report that they have a greater sense of possibility when they're led by diverse teams. If you're a service provider, you know, look for that woman-led company that you can help. I recently changed lawyers. And I was shocked that the, one of the six found, this big firm, and one of the six founding partners is on my business. We're not that big. And I asked him why, and Jay told me that he has three daughters and he has very few female clients, so he wants to do a good job for me. So you have a lot of ways you can help with this. It's, you know, help for Ren, um, help for any girl who's gonna be 15 and 27. But this is a really important side and very personal mission for me that I'd love your help with as well. So that's it, that's all I have to say. Jules, thank you so much for your sharing of those stories, and I, I think you fit in very well with the theme here tonight, and that's you don't succeed without passion, and you've certainly demonstrated that. Thank you for that. Thanks for stopping here tonight on your way to Chicago. We appreciate that. Um, it also occurred to me that timing is everything, and if you had had, had Sugar at the right time, you could have repaired your shoes, <laughs> which would have been nice. You know? As a matter of fact, with a little of that and some duct tape, you could totally uh, repair historically a 56 Nash Rambler. <laughs>